All right. Our final class, the seventh class of essential oil components, is something that I like to call multifunction or multifunctional. And there's no particular property that these have. They really can't be grouped together to have anything in common other than the fact that they have multiple functional groups on the same molecule. So that's why they're all kind of lumped in this catch-all category that doesn't fit into anything else. And some of the more common ones are things like methyl salicylate, which everyone should be familiar with, in ter at least the odor of. Because it's the odor of what? Of what? No, no, not spearmint. Wintergreen, that's right. And it's this one. Okay. It's in wintergreen. and birch, which are essentially chemically almost identical. They're both 99% plus methyl salicylate. So you aren't going to notice a whole lot of difference between your winter or your birch sample and your methyl salicylate sample. Which is a good thing because we're only going to be tested over the methyl salicylate. <laughs> huh? You think there's a big difference? Really? Well, I mean, you can definitely smell the winter green and the marsh, but the marsh is too like, I don't know. It reminds me of the lips a bit. Well, they both should, you know, really. Uh, that's really it. I mean, two oils that this is found in, and but it's this one is huge production. This one, over the years, is really almost non-existent in production anymore. It's more expensive to produce. Uh, and when you're producing an oil that's 99% one component, why would you do it from here versus here when this is a lot more labor intensive, it's a lot lower yield, and it's a lot harder to do. So most of your uh, natural source of methyl salicylate is going to come from this. China, Chinese wintergreen. It's a big, big product. Difference of price could be $10 a kilo for this and a couple of hundred bucks a kilo for that for a very chemically similar product. But as some people, they do find a difference. In it. I, it, that's always shocked me when people say that. And there are a lot of people that say that. There's a, oh, I could tell the difference. There's a huge difference. But I just don't see. I mean, I can see a difference. I can smell a difference, but it's very, very subtle, and they're so chemically close. But some people will swear it's just like night and day. <coughs> okay, the next one that we want to talk about is eugenol, which is a very important molecule. And if you smell that, you should get a clove-like odor out of it. Okay. This would be in, this is uh, eugenol. This would be in clove oil at say 70 to 80 percent. It's also found in cinnamon leaf. And again around around 75 percent or so. Notice cinnamon leaf is uh, 75 percent eugenol whereas the bark remember is what? The bark is cinnamic aldehyde. So same plant that it comes from, different part of the plant, big difference in the oil. 
And if you smell that, if you smelled cinnamon leaf and cinnamon bark, you'd see a huge difference. Did the m and just bolt in? No, never. No. The cinnamon bark is a very expensive, uh, valuable oil that's, you know, a couple hundred to several hundred dollars a kilo, depending on the source. Cinnamon leaf is a mass-produced, very inexpensive oil, typically in the $10 to $20 range. Um, other oils that would have eugenol are bay, uh, bay. And when I say, there's two things that people refer to as bay. One is bay laurel, which is not this one. Bay oil and uh, percentage-wise could be, say, 60%. It's also an allspice. So it's, it's in a lot of things. Uh, eugenol, I put it under multifunctional, just like I did with the, we didn't say it, but if I look back at the methyl salicylate, if you look back at the methyl salicylate, you'll see an ester group on there, you'll see a phenol group, or an alcohol or phenol, however you want to classify that. Same thing here. If you look here, we have an ether group, right? What else do we have here? We have an alcohol. Yeah, and if we look at the larger picture of this with this, it's a phenol. We have an alkene. Typically, well, a lot of times you will see people classify things like eugenol. There are other molecules like this that have this a phenyl group with this propene structure on it, and they'll call them phenylpropanoids. I never did like that name because it's just like, well, I'm just going to make up something. And and that's what they did, but um, and it just and that just describes this part. The real chemistry is is over here when you talk about you know its odor profile and stuff like that. That's this is all where it's where it's coming from. So to say phenylpropanoid is really not to me the best choice of terminology. Any questions over that eugenol? It's a very burning, uh, warm molecule, warm feeling. Um, it can be numbing. It can be, uh, they used to use it in dentistry. In fact, some do still use it, to, clove oil to numb the gums and teeth before they do anything to it. Clove cigarettes, well, yeah, they'll numb your lips. The next one there is vanillin. Notice all these have a phenyl group in it. Okay, let's identify the functional groups there. What do we see? Yeah, we see an ether right here. We see an alcohol here, right? Aldehyde here. And a phenol. And this, where do you think that comes from? <laughs> Chocolate, yeah. Cocoa. Uh, no, it's, come, it's in vanilla. It's in the vanilla bean. Okay, this is what defines the quality of the vanilla bean. It's usually an absolute or CO2. It's an extracted product, a solvent extracted product. And they will quote the percentage of vanillin in that product as a measure of quality. This is the typical odor of vanilla. If you smell that sample, that's the first thing that you'll probably will come to your mind is that Vanilla flavor, vanilla ice cream, or something like that. It's a very pleasant odor. Vanillin is a very, very important 
aroma chemical and a very, very important flavor chemical, okay? It's in every vanilla flavor. Anything that tastes like vanilla has that in it. And there's another uh, chemical called ethylvanillin that's even more intensely vanilla flavored, but it's not found in nature. It's just the vanillin is. The ethyl vanillin would be a, a, an ethyl group, I, I think right here. I believe that methyl, well we can look it up. Either that or there's an ethyl group on the ring. But my first inclination would be that this methyl is now an ethyl. Right, this is the methyl group right here, right? Yeah. What are you coming up with? You got ethyl vanillin? Yeah, but it's a para, para aldehyde with the ethyl group in the ether. Whereas here it's an ortho. Oh, no. Well, yeah, it is ethyl, but it's, yeah, it's a different uh, arrangement too. Right. So you got aldehyde. You put your aldehyde in the para position to have that. Right. So this would come down here, right? Um, this one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so ethylvanillin would be that with uh, the O and then a... Other, other one. Your aldehyde comes down the Oh. And the stays next to the... Oh, okay. So this goes here like that and then this comes down here. Okay, there we go. So this one is even probably 10 times more intensely vanilla. Used a lot in flavors, but it's not found in nature. Only the vanillin is found in nature. Um, I was gonna say, when, you, when they extract this stuff, have you ever seen vanilla beans? The long, skinny, brown beans? Uh, the true vanilla absolute, which you have, right? You have a sample there. Look at that product compared to, there you go. This is your vanilla absolute. How dark it is. And when you smell that compared to the vanillin, the pure vanillin crystal, this is way more complex and it's got, a, it's got an earthiness to it. I think it's really, I like it a lot. Most people just like straight vanillin. They, you know, they prefer that flavor over the whole, the natural vanilla bean flavor. They have the uh, vanilla with the composition also. Yeah, I'm not, don't worry about that. I'm not, I'm not gonna ask you to regurgitate that. The, I mean, you're gonna know if it's, well, you're not, you don't have ethyl vanillin anyway, so. Oh, well, I'm saying that on the sheet, like they have vanilla, vanilla then. Vanillin? It. It's also in the pair position on it. It's not north though. Okay. I'll have to check, correct that if it's wrong. Okay. Is this? Next one is Vera Moss, which is a nice smelling one. These are milder odors. You can't smell it? Dip a strip down in it. All right. What do we have here? This is a molecule found in oak moss absolute. It's used a lot in fragrance perfumery. Um, it's a base note. You give it, it's, called, it, it's said to round out a fragrance, smooth it out. It's a very soft, sweet, sort of woody. Um, but we have what? We have these alcohol groups 
which are also phenols. And then we have what else? Ester. Ester here. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Uh, but it is not found in anything else but that oak moss absolute. Again, if you looked at the true oak moss absolute, it'd be a very dark brown viscous material. It's extracted, whereas this pure material is a solid. Okay. Any questions? All right. For next week, then, remember, we're just going to be tested over the chemical components, not the essential oils, because we'll cover the oils, most of those in the second half of the course, and we are not going to be tested over the solids, just the liquid chemical components. So that should be an easy week, 10, 10 components. <laughs>